want to get going. I want to thank you first off for all joining us today. Um, we uh, at High Trade, I know there's a lot of people in here not familiar with the studio. Uh, we're a collective of personal trainers, so there's about 20 of us, and we do one-on-one -on -one fitness programming. Uh, we don't do group classes, and we don't do um, like a gym membership. We do one-on-one -on -one training because we believe that's the best way to get you guys to your goals. We get to turn over a lot of stones that way. We get to look at sleep, we get to look at nutrition, and we get to look at strength, which is our bread and butter. Um, we always say that we're more than just a good sweat, uh, and this lecture series is kind of a reflection of that. Education is one of our core values, and we try as much as we can to impart knowledge on our clients, uh, both during their sessions and then with experts uh, on these winter lecture series. So we're really excited to have Dr. Colleen McGinnis with us this morning, uh, talking about how strength training can aid runners in staying uh, happy and healthy and injury free. So I will kind of wrap things up a little bit at the end um, with our next lecture series date and a couple other uh, announcements, but uh, for now, Thanks again for coming. I'm going to turn it over to Colleen. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming to join us on a, your Sunday morning, taking some time out um, to be here and, and to hopefully learn a little something today. Um, louder. My name is Colleen. I am a doctor of physical therapy as well as a personal trainer and nutrition coach here at Hyatt Training. Um, you know, today our topic is, is, is ready to run. It's mainly to help keep you running injury free. Um, how many people here today are runners or run? Good. And how many people here train runners? Good. Maybe some people don't know why they're here, but <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's the main focus of today. Um, you know, a few disclaimers before we start. My dad has always told me that I talk really fast, so I will do my best to slow down. Um, I'm from Florida, so I'll probably swear, so I'm just going to say <laughs> sorry in advance for that. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll most definitely kind of stumble and fumble over my words, but I will do my best to, to get us to the end. Um, so the biggest thing here is, is that 75% um, of runners will suffer an injury, injury every year. That's a pretty big number, right? And injury is the number one reason that people stop running, okay? Who wants to run when they're in pain, right? Um, you know, most common injuries that we see are tendonitis, um, plantar fasciitis, stress, you know, bone stress injuries, shin splints, IT band syndrome, there's a ton, right? Um, but good news is, is that most of those are largely avoidable. Right? So no wonder that um, there's so many injuries or a high prevalence of injuries <coughs> in runners, um, because running places 1.5 times our body weight stress through our joints, which is huge, right? And it's over and over and over again for each drive. So there's kind of no incidents where, where you're not putting that load through your joints, right? And like I said, a 75% injury rate every year. Um, good news is, is that there's compelling evidence that with incorporating heavy resisted, slow resisted strength training into your program just twice per week, we can reduce that injury rate by 50%, which is huge, right? That's pretty big. Um, so not only will that heavy, slow resistance strength training reduce your risk for injury by 50%, um, but it's also gonna improve your running economy and performance, okay? So we're gonna reduce risk for injury and then plus make you faster, right? Make you less fatigued, all great things. Um, super important as we age, especially for tendon health, because after the age of 35, we start to lose tendon stiffness um, and health. So even more important as we get older to really focus on that strength training aspect um, and incorporate our running program. Um, like I said, the strength training will improve running economy and performance. There was a study published not too long ago that showed a 5% increase in your 5K time run just after the runners implemented the heavy strength resistant program two times a week for six weeks. So that's 12 sessions of strength training with a 5% increase in five times, or 5K time, which I'll take it, right? I need it. <laughs> um, <coughs> So basically, at the end of the day, you know, if, if you're not making time to strength train, then you're basically going to make time for an injury, right? You're going to be off the road running um, and probably going to maybe with me, a physical therapist. Not so bad for me, but not so good for you. Um, one of the hardest things is, is to get runners to lift, right, to get them into the gym. 
they want to be out running. They don't want to be spending time with teammates in the gym. Um, so there's lots of misconceptions out there regarding strength training for runners. Um, you know, one of the biggest ones is that running will make you run slower. Well, I just told you about a study that will actually improve your, your performance 5%, right? Um, so it actually does the opposite, proven to. Um, we see that, that runners think that training should be high rep, low weight to mimic the endurance demands of running. Um, there's no research to back that up, okay? All the research shows that the strength training needs to be low rep, high resistance, okay? Um, that's what shows to improve our tendon health, to reduce our risk for injury, to improve performance, improve economy, okay? Um, another one is that the glutes are the most important muscle for runners. Glutes are definitely important, right? They have their time and place, especially for sprinters. I'm not sure how many people here are sprinters, but um, if you are a sprinter, if you do a lot of hills, glutes are important. If we're younger, especially younger females um, that have a lot of knee instability, our glutes are super important to focus on for that to help with the alignment of our knees as we're running. Um, but arguably, it's actually your calf complex is the most important muscle, right, to strengthen, to maintain running. Um, we lose 31% of our push-off force between the ages of 20 and 60. So by that I mean when you're going through your running cycle and, and you go to push off gear, right, to propel you forward, to give you that momentum to run vertically, we lose 31% between those ages of 20 and 60. So again, even like more important as we get older to really focus on strengthening our calves, okay? Um, runners should do multi-joint exercises that are functional. I do agree with this 100%, um, but we also need to incorporate isolated single joint strengthening. Again, for example, that calf complex, right? Um, our soleus, which is, which is the muscle that's part of our calf complex that sits underneath that fat belly muscle that you see your gastroc, it can only be strengthened isolated, right? I mean, it can be with multi, you, know, you can do a squat, you might get a little bit of soleus strengthening, but to really make sure that we're targeting that muscle, we need to specifically perform exercises that's gonna isolate that muscle to strengthen. Um, so, what does this program look like? Um, the basic parameters of this heavy, slow resistance program is two to three times per week, two to four sets of four to ten slow reps um, with rest two to three minutes between sets. The rest here is so important because we're really working towards 70 to 80 percent of our run rep max for those exercises. Okay, so and slow is, is that's also the key here. Our tendons are shown to respond better to that slow training, right? So that's what's really gonna build that tissue capacity in our tendons. It's gonna make it more resilient and, and kind of fight against um, our risk for repetitive injury, repetitive stress injury, which basically is what running causes, right? Um, that load, again, we're working up towards a 70 to 80% of one rep max. If you have no idea what that means, um, means we're working pretty heavy. And again, if you don't know what that means, that's a really good time to work with a trainer, someone who does, right? We don't want to get you injured in the weight room. Our goal is to, to prevent injuries for running, right? Um, so an example might be if, if we're going to work on squats, um, you know, you start with a body weight squat, and then we might load you up with either a kettlebell or, or some dumbbells, um, but then progressing to a barbell squat, because ultimately our goal, again, is to get to 1.5 times our body weight to lift for that squat because that's the amount of stress that's going through our joints every stride we take when we're running, okay? You're just not gonna walk into a weight room and, and load up you know, 8% of your one rep max and squat, okay? So really important to make sure that, that you work with someone if you're not an advanced lifter or a seasoned lifter to kind of get you to that, to that spot. Um, progression, we kind of talked about that just now a little bit, slowly progressing up um, to again to those heavy loads. Um, some things to consider, experience, you know, if you're a newbie, work with a trainer, get a program, right? Um, timing, so we should ultimately be strength training year round. Um, studies show that if we stop strength training, we'll actually lose tendon um, stiffness within four to six weeks. So super important to make sure that you're incorporating a strength training program mm -hmm. all year round. Um, timing can also be considered, let's say, you know, during the rainy season in Portland. Like, I don't want to be out there running in the cold and the wet, right? So maybe I'm going to ramp up my strength training sessions during that time. Um, I'm still going to run, but it's going to be on a treadmill, and I'm really going to focus on building strength, right? Maybe as it's coming closer to I'm preparing for a race, 
you know, since I've ramped up my strength training during my off season per se, I can kind of reduce it a little bit as I'm coming close to the race time, and then I'm increasing my runs per week, right? Um, age, so maybe a, a younger female, we're gonna work more on, on pelvic and lumbar stability. Um, we see a lot of weakness there, which can lead to a lot of knee injuries. So maybe in our younger adolescents, we're working there more, but again, as we get older, um, especially into our master's age level, we really wanna be focusing on that calf complex. Really gonna reduce risk for injury, prevent that shuffling or that shorter stride length that we see in a lot of our older runners, okay? Um, gender, again, females, we're probably gonna focus, or it's good to focus more on that lumbopelvic region, especially if a female um, has had a baby, right? That's where we get a lot of weakness in that area to make room for the child. So really important to make sure that, that we strengthen that back up. Um, okay, so we're gonna go over some key exercises that everyone should be doing. Um, I want you guys to take off your socks and shoes.
you know, we have the patient stand just a few inches up on the Miller step and then on the metronome. So if we're to show it to you, on each beat, first beat you're up, second beat your heel touches down, right? And you want to maintain that pace for a minute. So if you think about your up, down, up, down, up, down, right? So for a minute, you should be able to do it. That's what the normative values are. So that's not saying, um, you know, if you, if you can't do that, you, you at least need to be able to do that. Yeah. This is just a test. Yeah, so you, you should test it and you should be able to do this. This is the normative values for your age. Is that the single leg? Single leg. Yeah, single leg. Um, step ups. Step ups are great. Posture is super important for runners, okay? We really wanna make sure that we can maintain upright posture. As we get fatigued, that's when you'll see that posture kind of starts to round forward, flex forward at the hips, and, and that's when we get an increased risk for, for injury. Um, you know, when we are running, we do want a little bit of forward posture, but we don't want a forward flex posture at our hips. That forward posture should actually come from our ankles, right? That's where we're, we're leaning forward at, not at our hips. We should be nice and, and upright here. Step up is a great exercise um, because again, you know, we're mimicking it's single leg, unilateral, which is great. We can have that push off, really focusing on the push off at the bottom, so we can include that calf musculature. Um, and then coming straight up tall, you know, we can do side. So not only from the back up, but we can do side, you know, you can do front, you can do kind of where you reach behind, kind of really target that glute. Um, this is great to load up with maybe a weighted vest. You can load it up with kettlebells with dumbbells. Um, so just a really good unilateral posture focused where you're still gonna mimic that stride, okay? Um, okay, so deadlift, more of a, a multi, you know, compound lift. I'm not crazy about this guy's posture. Oops, this guy's posture, but okay, we'll deal with it. Um, so deadlift is great because it's posterior chain, right? Half of our running is in that posterior chain. We're, we're going through extension for the back of that stride to then advance forward. So we need to make sure that our, that our glutes, that our hamstrings, that our lumbar spine, everything is firing, right? Um, not only is our deadlift great for running, but for every day, right? We have to bend down and pick things up all day long. We pick up children, we pick up our dog, we pick up our groceries, kind of whatever it is. So to be strong and functional, in this deadlift is, is important for every day, right, as well as, as running. Um, our glutes take on 1.5 to 3.5 times our body weight force during running, and our hamstrings two to three times our body weight force during running. So this is a really great exercise to help target, again, that, that posterior chain that is activated throughout the running, the running gait cycle. A good progression and also to use as a, as a unilateral strengthener is the single leg Romanian deadlift. Um, this is really important to help us stabilize our pelvis so that we can keep it nice and neutral during that running pattern or gait cycle. Um, research, research shows that just a one degree drop in your hips during that single leg stance or you know during that swing phase of gait. So if, if my hips, my pelvis drops just one degree, I have an increased chance of 80% to be classified as injured. So one degree, 80% higher risk that I'll be classified as injured, right? So really, really important to work these unilateral exercises that are gonna really help with pelvic <coughs> and lumbar stability to prevent that drop, okay? So when you say drop, tilting it backwards or tilting it forward? Um, tilting sideways. Oh, sideways, gotcha. Yeah, so if I'm, if I'm standing on this drop leg, it, yeah, if I, if I drop. Um, you know, lunge, they say, is kind of the most specific exercise to running because it mimics that running stride. Um, lunges are great, you know, your, your front leg's in that flex position and then your back leg is in that extended position. Um, it really helps to work on core stability, upright posture. Again, you can do it multi-directional. I would highly recommend that, forward, backwards, lateral. Um, we're not always running on a treadmill or a nice, you know, flat surface. So we have Forest Park right over here. I'm sure lots of people go over there and run. Um, that on-level ground is really gonna challenge us even more. So our exercises should challenge us too. 
So I would even recommend, you know, you do one forward, then you do a lateral, then maybe you go forward again, and then into another lateral or to the front, right? Kind of vary it up because we know that running is very variable depending on the surface that we're running on. Um, a progression to that is the Bulgarian split squat. Really great exercise, really gonna challenge your balance. Again, work on that upright posture. It's good because you're gonna get good mobilization in, in the hip and the knee. Um, and just, it's, you know, just really challenging compared to, to the regular lunge. Can't really do multi-directional there so much, but um, it's gonna get you more in that single leg unilateral strengthening. Um, uh, squat. So again, this is another exercise that everyone should be doing, no matter if you're a runner or not. This is a great exercise that you need to work up for a good goal. It should be to the 1.5 times your body weight to lift for this, right? Um, you know, squats kind of got a bad rap in the 1960s, and that was from a, a few badly run studies that said squatting was bad for your knees. Um, since then, this has been disproven over and over again. Um, squatting is shown to be very good for your knees, right? There was a study that came out that said people who regularly squat below parallel have stronger knees, more stable knees than long distance runners and basketball players, okay? So really important to squat. Um, our quads take on four to six times our body weight force. I mean, that's you know, the second below the Achilles tendon in the gastroc complex, or calf complex, so really important to, to strengthen those quads. Um, you know, again, you can start with a body weight squat, progressing to using a kettlebell or dumbbells, and then ultimately up to the barbell if you're comfortable. Um, you know, you might even do a front rack barbell to get more of that, of that quad activation. But again, 1.5 times our body weight is the goal for that. If you don't have, to have good ankle mobility, I'm not going to force you into below parallel, right? So with squatting, you know, people talk about where your feet should be and if you should go below parallel, right? A lot of that comes down to your personal mechanics um, and, and kind of where you're at, what level you're at. Ultimately, if we can get you safe to squat below parallel with a loaded weight, that's a good goal, right? But I'm not off the bat. If you don't have that mobility, I'm not going to tell you to do that, right? But getting to parallel is good because when you sit down, you know, you're at parallel, right? Mm -hmm. You're not off the toilet or even out of your car. You're most likely below parallel. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to safely squat to that level, right? And then and with, a, with a load on you. Um, bridge, great exercise. Um, you know, I really like this for our female runners. 30% um, of females experience urinary incontinence when they're running. That's a huge number. Right, so this is a great exercise specifically after childbirth, right, to incorporate into the running program. This is great because you can incorporate some pelvic floor strengthening into here. You know, exhale, contract your pelvic floor, bridge up, right? So we're not only here focusing on external musculature, but also internal, right? If we can reduce a female's um, occurrence of incontinence while running, that's huge, right? That stops a lot of females from running, from participating in sports, from lifting, from squatting. So if there's anything that we can do um, to reduce that, you know, that's a score. Um, so very important, lumbo pelvic strengthening, you know, think about pelvic floor in females um, and incorporating that into the program. <coughs> uh, progression of the bridge, single leg bridge. Again, we're gonna get into that unilateral lower extremity strengthening, which is really important, um, you know, the glutes play a really key role in the alignment. So if we see any, any runners in particular, let's say we have them do a step down, right, and that knee caves in, or they're just doing a, a, a heel tap down and that knee wants to come in, right? That's, that's a sign right away that we really need to stroke, focus on hip strengthening, glute strengthening, external location strengthening, okay? Significantly increases your risk of, let's just say, IT band pain, um, you know, patellar tendonitis, if, if that knee wants to cave in. We might see it more on going either up or, or down inclines than just on a, a straight plane, and then of course with fatigue. Um, so as a trainer, that's something to look out for, right? We might screen for that 
see if that's happening, and if it does, we know specific exercises that we want to implement into the program for, for our clients. Question. Mm -hmm. The tendonitis you mentioned, mm -hmm. what is that exactly? What is tendonitis? Well, no, I don't mean tendonitis, but the patella tendonitis? Oh, the patella, uh, so the, right when you get pain or you get that kneecap, your patella, yeah. Your patella yeah. Oh. But, you know, a lot, a lot of runners get this lateral kind of knee pain here, that's and that's from that IT band coming in. Yeah, so, so really important hip thrusting with the band around those knees, really get those external rotators involved um, to reduce that, that constant pull that could be happening on that IT band that's causing the pain. <coughs> okay, so a row. This might not seem like a typical exercise you would include in, in your running program um, or for your running clients, but again, super important for that upright posture that we maintain that. Um, anyone here do triathlons? Yeah, okay, so, so it takes about 15 minutes for, for our mechanics to normalize after coming off a bike into the run, right? That's a long time, okay? So if we can focus on, on improving that upright posture and being able to, to get those mechanics more normalized quicker, right? Our running performance is gonna be significantly better, okay? So really important and to incorporate anything that's, that's postural related, that upright row. <laughs> I like to put runners, you know, in some kind of squat bring them to parallel or 90 degree squat, <laughs> bring them up on their toes, right? Mm -hmm. So now I have calf strengthening, plus I have quad, you know, hamstring strengthening, plus I'm, I'm getting that row, okay? Um, core is super important for runners. When we run, you know, we transfer energy from our limbs to the ground, then it comes back through our limbs and then, and then kind of disperses through our bodies. So we say if someone has a weak core, they have an energy leak because you know that reaction force is, is being leaked out somewhere and we're not getting to where we need in all of our limbs. So that's gonna reduce our running performance. It's gonna you know, cause more energy to be burned that we're not using to use for running, right? So we're gonna fatigue faster. Um, we're gonna lose that posture quickly. Um, and then once we start to lose posture, that's when all sorts of things go wrong. Um, so farmers carry, again, you know, all day long, let's say if we're carrying a box, we're carrying groceries, we're carrying our kid, we're carrying our dog, whatever it is, we need to be strong um, in this carry. So a good goal for this is to be able to carry half your body weight in each arm for one minute, okay? Um, we know that grip strength, of course, is gonna be our limiting factor here for a lot of people, especially women's. So load them up with a weighted vest, you know, have them carry a trap bar, something that's not going to be so just all your weights on, on your grip. But again, you should be able to do half your body weight in each hand for a minute while maintaining that good upright posture, okay? Plank, who doesn't love a plank? Um, planks are, are really good for, you know, especially side planks are, are oblique strengthening, which again is gonna help stabilize us when we're running. Um, the goal here is, is up to 60 seconds without, you know, your hips dropping. This will help to, for that, um, hip stability or to keep that pelvis nice and stable too while you're running. <laughs> Towel press, I love this exercise. This is probably my favorite. This can be varied in so many <coughs> different ways. You can use different resistance bands. The thing here is, is my resistance band is, is, you know, here, right, that's tied down and, and then I'm here and I'm pushing out. So I'm, you know, fighting against rotation. Okay, so it's a really great anti-rotational strengthening exercise. Um, you know, we have rotation when we're running, which we want, but since again, since we do have so much rotation, we're gonna fatigue out there. So really making sure that we're strengthening anti-rotation muscles in that trunk and core um, is super important to be able to maintain that, that good upright posture. Um, so timing. So one thing that, that's important to remember is that since the strength training that we want you to do, since it is so high demand, up to that 80% one rep max, you're gonna get tired, right? You're gonna fatigue out from it. So if you're gonna plan a training program, if you do a heavy strength resistive training session, you wanna make sure that you allow for 24 hours recovery before you go and do an intensive run, okay? And by that I don't mean you're gonna go for your 5K jog, or you're gonna you know, go for a, a run with your friend, um, you know, a couple miles, right? That's, that's not a big deal. But if you're training for a race and let's say you're doing tempo runs that day or you're doing, um, you know, intense interval running that day, whatever it is, make sure that you have that 24 hour recovery.
recovery period so that you can perform at your optimal best. Um, we all have lives, we all are hectic and crazy and work a lot, and so maybe that's not optimal that you can have that 24 hours. So if you need to do it in the same day, we recommend that you run first, have about three hours of recovery time before, you, again, you do your intensive running session. Again, not a jog, not a couple of miles, you know, because you're out there really trying to book it, training for a race, okay? Um, kind of the sweet spot for running is three to four times per week to prevent injury, and this is so that we have enough tissue capacity built up. We have enough stiffness in our tendons built up. One or two times a week just isn't enough in our recreational runners or triathletes. And again, we can actually increase our risk for injury if we're only going out running once a week, right? Our tissues, our tendons specifically, they just haven't built up enough resilience and stiffness and, and we, can, we can injure them. I like to think about a tendon is like a bungee cord, okay? So, so if we just have that one bungee cord and it's loose, there's more of a chance that, that we could snap that bungee cord, right? But if, if we have multiple bungee cords or if we have a really thick bungee cord, you're right, it's stronger. So that's basically what we're doing to our tendons when we're training them with this slow resisted strength training. We're making them thicker, more resilient, more stiff. So it's gonna prevent that, that you know, either repetitive use where it gets injured or, or it actually tearing or snapping. What, what about a blend of cycling and running? Excuse me? What about a blend of cycling and running? I mean, there's not quite that much overlap, but there's some overlap, right? So there's two runs, specific for the running that, that you should be getting three times a week in, especially if you're going to be running at an intensive running level. Right? Um, you're just not, you're not getting that force through the tendon with cycling or you are with running. Um, so if you can get, you know, it doesn't have to be a long run per se, but again, we're just trying to, we're trying to build that stiffness in our tendon up. Um, so it, it doesn't have to be a crazy run, but you can get out there and get another shorter run. running before you bike and then run a little bit after. Yeah, just to get that, that extra um, bit of running in there. Um, best run on non-consecutive days and, and strength training two days per week. Um, that's just what shows to give us the best recovery to, to continue to have the best performance when we're out there running because ultimately that's what, that's what runners are looking for, right? Mm. So we're gonna touch a little bit on shoes. Um, <coughs> I find shoes very interesting. Uh, I really enjoy this time kind of deeping di or diving deeper into shoes. Um, you guys still have your shoes on? If you do, I want you to take out and sole of your shoe. It's still a shoe. It's still not running. I don't think I can have either one. Thank you. So, do you guys remember when, when you went to Foot Locker back in the day, right? And, and they had that little metal shoe measure and you, and you put your foot on it and it measured what size you were, right? Ultimately, you should be doing this with your shoes if you're going to buy one. You need to take out the insole and you need to step on it, okay? If any part of your foot falls over that insole, don't buy that shoe. It doesn't fit you, okay? <laughs> right, so... <laughs> <laughs> Right, you're going to cause compression in that forefoot of, uh, in your forefoot, which again is going to lead to pain and injury. So, so that's the first thing you need to do. Like, take out the insole, make sure that your foot actually fits within that insole. Okay, if not, it's not the right shoe. Um, you know, another thing you want to check for is the sh where the shoe breaks. Right, so your shoe should break. Okay, you want to take it and bend it, and it should break where your big toe extends because that's where your foot breaks every step you take, right? This is one thing I highly recommend that you test in shoes. Those shoes right there are known for defense for this specific thing. Check your other shoe. From shoe to shoe, they've been known that one breaks in the right spot and one doesn't. Um, so certain shoes, for some reason, they'll, they'll have manufacturer defects, but just make sure that you check both shoes. That's one place that you might actually see a defect. 
it is where the shoe breaks. And again, it, it should break right where, where your big toe extends, okay? Um, again, make sure there's no pinching in, in your forefoot, right? Certain shoes are made for people with, with a wider foot. Super important so that we're not getting blisters, pain, you know, um, compression there in the forefoot. Another thing you want to check for is there's not excessive twisting in the middle of the shoe. I mean, you want some stiffness, um, but you don't want it to be excessive, right? Where it's, it's you have too much, okay? Um, has anyone ever been told that they're a pronator, that the foot pronates when they run? Yeah, and, and did someone try and sell you a shoe to prevent or correct that pronation? You should go get your money back, right? <laughs> Bullshit. Um, there, is no, <laughs> there is no evidence out there to suggest that pronation leads to injury, right? So why correct it? Why are we going to then prevent you from pronating, right? And then most likely cause injury because that's going to mess up the rest of your mechanics if that's your normal mechanics for you, right? <coughs> so don't buy a shoe that prevents um, pronation because, again, that, that's what your normal mechanics are, and there's no evidence to say that that pronation will lead to injury. A lot of times when they put those shoes on you and then they put you back on that treadmill, they're like, oh, look, you're not pronating, okay? What's happened there is the shoe is stiff, right? That's what the shoe's made to do is prevent motion. So the shoe is stiff, but in actuality, your bone inside that shoe is still moving 20 degrees. You just can't see it with the shoe on, right? So did we actually correct anything at all, right? Um, the one thing that is found throughout all of research to reduce your risk for injury when it comes to shoes, okay, is, is having two to three different shoes that are of a different brand and, and model, right, um, that you rotate through within the week. So each run, you should be running in a different shoe within that week. So two to three shoes. That's been shown to reduce your risk for injury by 39%. That's huge. Wednesday, you wear your Adidas, Friday, you wear your Oms, whatever it is, right? Or if you're doing, if you do trail runs Monday, you know, you have your trail run shoe for Monday, you have your shorter distance shoe run for, for Wednesday, um, you know, whatever that may be. But that's the only thing that's been shown to reduce risk for injury, okay, when it comes to shoes. Um, at the end of the day, shoes have a, a small role in injury um, and injury prevention. Um, it's more comes down to, you know, poor gait mechanics muscular imbalances or training error, okay? So if, if none of that's in check, your shoe doesn't mean anything, right? Um, but ultimately, you know, the main thing is, is comfort. Comfort reigns supreme. So if you don't have a shoe that's comfortable for you, you're more likely to have pain and injury. So in all the other stuff we said, you know, the anti-pronation, how much cushion you have, none of that has been shown to reduce risk for injury. So, you know, find what works for you and what's comfortable and stick to that, okay? Um, the biggest thing is marketing is not science. You know, they like to think it is, but it's not. I went home for Christmas, I wear ons, but that's only because I think they're the most comfortable shoe ever, right? Um, it has nothing to do with, with the drop in it, with the stability of it, with the pronation, it has nothing to do with that. I, I just think they're very comfortable, so I wear them. Um, I went home for Christmas and my brother, he does a lot of races and, and he's done half marathons, I mean half and he had ons. And I was like, oh, when did you get your on? And he's like, oh, I, I just bought them. And I was like, oh, how come? And he's like, oh, he's like, all the good runners at the races, all the ones who win, they're wearing ons. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, do you like it? He's like, I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> but he bought it. So, um, I mean, I, I saw him in the summer and he was still wearing it, so he must like it. Um, you know, another thing to think about, too, is, is don't wear your running shoes for everyday shoes, right? Because you're just going to alter the mechanics. You know, you walk differently than you run. And so you're going to have different wear and tear on that shoe, um, and it will ultimately um, alter your running mechanics. So wear your running shoes for running, okay? Um, that's, that's another important thing. Should there at least be some consistency in, like the heel drop and the... No. Uh, Whatever is comfortable for you. And you might find... I mean, but you keep your running shoes. No. Because, no. you know, ultimately what we're trying to do there is if you're in the same heel drop, let's say, each time you're running, you're going to get that same, most likely very similar, gate pattern, gate mechanics every stride, and 
that's what's going to increase our risk for that overuse injury, yeah. right? That repetitive use. So by by kind of paralleling or alternating shoes, different shoes throughout that week, we're going to target different muscles. Okay, so we're actually going to strengthen some muscles that that we wouldn't be strengthening if we're constantly wearing that same shoe. Plus, we're going to break up that mechanic just a little bit enough to hopefully prevent an overuse injury. Okay. Um, you know, I feel like a, a lot of runners are out there looking for that magic bullet of a shoe, and, and it just doesn't exist. Not yet. So again, find what you like, what's comfortable, um, and stick to it. This is just a, an example of a, of a running program or a return to running program. Like I said, most injuries are, are either from poor mechanics um, or training error. You know, a lot of people, let's say if it's been raining for the last couple of months and it was a beautiful Sunday and you went out and, and you ran Forest Park for 10 miles because that's what you did in October, right? You're going to hurt yourself. It's too much, too soon. So just knowing that, that you should really follow a program when you're getting back into running, of, of ramping that running up, incorporating your heavy loaded resistance strength training, you know, twice per week into that program is ultimately what's going to reduce that risk for injury by 50% and keep you out there running. Um, so key things from today, incorporate heavy, resisted, slow, resistance training twice per week um, of that two to four sets of four to ten slow, heavy reps with two to three minute rest in between. Um, exercises that we really want to include in that program, you know, calf strengthening, lunges, deadlifts, squats, um, postural training. Um, really making sure, again, that we're targeting that calf musculature, especially as we age. If all of this is very foreign, you have no idea what went on today, work with a pro, right? We got plenty here, so reach out. Um, and of course, if you are struggling with any pain um, or injury, um, you know, seek, seek a physical therapist or, or someone that can help you with that so we can get you back running pain free. Um, any questions? Yes? How about the shoes? Yes. Are there, um, how many hours Yeah, so there's, um, so I don't quote this wrong, there's, so they say that a loss, loss of initial shock of 25% occurs at 50 miles, 33% um, at 150 miles, and 45% at 500 miles, um, which a lot of times ends up depending on how much you're running, you know, that's six to seven to eight month, eight month range. Um, you know, again, if you're altering you know, through two or three different shoes, it's going to last you a lot longer. Even though that initial investment seems like it's more, it, it should last you twice as Right, so it's really not a significant cause there. Anyone else? Yep. Was there any kind of cross training for running or did you run to just run and your legs and strengthen? As far as cross training, you mean just if you're kind of putting something else in, like if you're, if you're doing flat training or swimming or? Yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest thing, you know, to prevent injury, right, is, is that we want to get running in three days a week. That's what's been shown um, research-wise to reduce risk for injury. Um, I think it's great if you can incorporate cross-training and other exercises if you have time, um, but there's no research out there that shows that that will reduce your risk for injury, right? right? Um, there's lots of other benefits, you know, cardiovascular benefits, mental health benefits, kind of, kind of whatever stress relief, right? So nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I think it's great, but if you're really looking to reduce risk for injury, um, making sure that you get the strength training Myself, Lee will be around if you want to ask questions kind of of us individually if that feels more comfortable for you feel free to stick around there's still snacks and coffee um, and I know a lot of you here today are not members of the studio so I'll put in my sales pitch uh, that if you are interested in strength training and this has really piqued your interest and you want to talk to us we set up a lot of different things uh, our clients work with us once or twice a week but we do programming for people that don't necessarily come here and work out. They come and see us maybe once a month and do programs outside of that. But if you need guidance through this stuff, talk to us. Uh, there is a sheet at the back uh, for emails. Um, I'm happy to reach out. My job is to kind of match everybody with the best trainer possible for their goals. So we spend a lot of time 
on the intake process and making sure that you're matched up with somebody who really fits your personality and your schedule and your goals. Um, that's what we that's what we do. That's what I love to do. Um, so email us, <coughs> excuse me, back there. And then March 29th, which will be the last Sunday of this month, is our final winter lecture series, and it's titled Food is Medicine. And it's our friend Megan Barnett, who's a functional nutritionist. Um, so she works with people predominantly using diet nutrition as a means to um, well, medication for a lack of a better term. So if you have health issues that you think nutrition could be a better substitute than medicine, that would be a great use for her. If you're putting in all the time and energy to your nutrition, your strength training, your running and all that stuff, but still not seeing the results you want, there could be something going on nutritionally where you're either eating the wrong things or not enough of the right things. So she's looking at things like that. So really kind of how food impacts your overall health, longevity, energy, stuff like that. So I think it'll be very interesting. That'll be March 29th, the final Sunday, same time, 9 to 10 a.m. So um, we're happy to get you more information on that as well. Uh, again, we'll be around. Thanks so much for coming, and thank you. That was completely awesome. Yeah.